minds, touching minds. Telepathy is an experience many say they've had, but science isn't so sure. These twins say they talk to each other without words. A mother claims telepathy saved her twin child's life. This man's mind has been hired by the US government to try and spy by telepathy. Are these all merely mind games, or does telepathy really exist? This investigation into telepathy starts here, in New York City. Lisa and Debbie Gantz run a promotional agency that claims many thousands of twins on their books. A rich source of unscientific, yet fascinating anecdotes about telepathy. Twins have so many stories of telepathy and feeling each other's pain and happiness. We you have had, had exper yeah. experiences. Um, Lisa was living I in was, Australia. I was living in Australia, halfway around the world. And I was living in New York and City. And Debbie was living in New York. And I actually got in a serious car accident in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the outback. On a dark, deserted road, Lisa's car hit a cow and spun out of control. Debbie, some 10,000 miles away, says she knew instantly her sister was in trouble. I looked at my mother and I said, something's wrong. It was this intangible feeling that you can't actually explain to other people. And even when I had the accident, before anybody had, you know, contacted or we had gotten to somewhere we can make phone calls, she had already been calling all of my friends that lived in Sydney. That, Did anyone you know, talk to Because I couldn't, I never had such an intense feeling of somewhat like pain, but it wasn't my pain. It was her pain, so I couldn't verbalize it. So it must have been my sister. It's a perfect example of when you call it, you have a sixth sense. Even if we're not together, the experiences are shared through a connection that we can't explain. So when Debbie goes out on a date and has a good time, then I just stay home and feel it. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. <laughs> but can Debbie know for sure she reacted at the exact moment when Lisa was hurt? The Gantz's stories can't be confirmed by science and therefore don't offer satisfying evidence of actual telepathy. Lots of twins say they share experiences even when separated, such as earning identical examination results at school. We were always accused of uh, being, or cheating on tests because the teachers yeah. would have our tests and be like, well, you guys have the same answers, you guys have the same grades, even the multiple choice. We'd write the essay. same exact thing. Could this be telepathy? Or just simple coincidence? Or maybe even a natural result for two similar people in the same grade at school who live and study together? Anecdotes of twins that some may take as evidence of telepathy are rarely worthy of a second look. Perhaps a simple test for twins, 30 questions each on the differences between language in England and America, would share light. A professor of English, Marilyn Elkins, supervises the exam. She divides three sets of twins into separate rooms. Here's the test. Immune silently in your head with the twin in the other rooms. The Ashford twins believe they telepathically traded answers. We would sit there and focus on what the other one might be thinking and what, how they would answer it and yeah. what would come to us from the other. And if I didn't know one, I'd like, okay, Alicia, you know this one, and I'd, I'd kind of say, I'm putting this and she would put the same thing. So mentally, we were talking to each other. Thank you. As a teacher, if they were in my classroom, I might have some concerns. I don't see that the tests are exactly alike, but there are some similarities that I might find questionable. The Najees had the most correct, and they certainly had one unusually similar guess. The Ashford twins had 10 the same correct, and then they had the same wrong answer twice on the exam, and that's when you get very suspicious. Some results may seem suspicious, but they're not scientifically meaningful. 
with identical upbringings and similar brains, twins could be more likely to get similar scores. For a test like this to be meaningful, it requires scientific controls, experimental methods carefully designed to rule out other explanations. But for the most part, belief in telepathy relies not on real scientific research, but on the personal anecdotes of those who claim they experience it. Yet stories persist and seem compelling, especially to the twins who experience them. It was about three o'clock in the morning, we were asleep. I got up to use the restroom and I ended up fainting. I hit my eye and I probably was unconscious for about 20 minutes. And I, so I was knocked out asleep. Um, and then when I was sleeping, all of a sudden I heard Leisha, Leisha, Leisha. So I got up and I went to the bathroom and I found her laying there on the ground and she had split her eye open really bad. So I woke her up, took her to the emergency room, but it was kind of amazing because I, I just knew something was wrong with her. I started telling her this dream and, you know, about midway through it, she started finishing it. I had the exact same dream. The only difference is the same, it was reverse roles. I got in a really, really major car accident um, going 80 miles an hour on the freeway. I had a stopped car and she knew mm -hmm. right away that something was wrong. What's wrong? I actually felt pain here and yeah, she broke, and I broke my sternum and she felt pain in her chest. Selected stories that are seized on with glee by those seeking a reason to believe, but which carry even less weight among scientists than tales of UFOs or alien encounters. People often interpret coincidence as telepathy. Is there a way to put anecdotes like these to a controlled test? What's been seen so far is how difficult testing for telepathy can be. Another demonstration is set up and it's more structured. It'll use these twin boys. One is wired up to record his vital signs. The other is blindfolded and waiting. Then comes a series of stimuli. What's recorded is intriguing. What did the twins' reactions mean? Is this a sign of real telepathy? When looking at telepathy, can fact be separated from fiction? So far, the most intriguing tales heard are those from identical twins. Yet no one has produced evidence that their experiences are anything more than mere coincidence. Take the case of nine-year-old Richard and Damien Powells. According to their mother, the twins have demonstrated signs of telepathy almost from the moment they were born. In fact, Anna Powell says telepathy saved Damien's life. The first occasion was when they were three days old. I was feeding them both on my bed and I put Damien to the side of me and settled him there while changing Richard. Richard started to cry and then he started to scream. It looked like he was having a convulsion. His whole body started to shake. Then I did suddenly think twins relay messages to each other and as I looked down to make sure, he wasn't there. He'd rolled behind me into the other pillows, practically suffocated. He'd stopped breathing and his face was blue. And I had to give him mouth to mouth, resuscitate him. But if it hadn't have been for Richard, I believe to this day, Damon would be dead. Was this telepathy at work? Pals think so. I totally believe that is what they have, the boys between them. The twin boys' school grades are similar. Their mother thinks they may even share each other's aches and pains. When they were three, Damien was complaining about his knee was aching and it turned out to be Richard had a knee infection. The other major one was that Richard had really bad pains in his back and was crying with the pain. And uh, it was Damien who had uh, a shrunken kidney that they've discovered since. The twins are going to be monitored for signs of telepathic communication. First, the boys will be separated to avoid physical communication. Then Damien will be subjected to a series of stimuli to see if his twin reacts. 
polygraph now. Richard is connected to a polygraph machine by Guy Heseltine, a member of the American Polygraph Association. A polygraph detects physiological changes to the body that are invisible to the eye, but can be charted from moment to moment. Okay, this one's going to go around your stomach. Separate belts at the top and bottom of the chest record changes in breathing. Results appear on the two blue lines at the top of the computer screen. Electrodes measure electrical conductivity across the surface of the skin, recorded in green on the computer screen. An armband measures pulse rate. It also records any changes in blood pressure, the red line on the screen. Finally, Richard wears headphones to ensure that he doesn't hear what's taking place in the house during the trial. Downstairs, Damien concentrates on his absent twin by drawing his picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm drawing chicken football. No, he's a bit bored at the moment, isn't he? Yes. First, Damien is startled. Is it possible his reaction will trigger a reaction in his twin? And just after the plates were dropped, it appears that there's an increase in the cardio activity, followed very closely by uh, an increase in the skin resistance, which uh, could well be significant. Upstairs, Richard relaxes as Damien takes a second test. Blindfolded, he tries to find sweets in a jar. He discovers to his shock that the bottom of the jar holds nothing but ice-cold water. Richard appears unaffected, but moments later, the polygraph chart reveals him taking a deep breath. Blood pressure and pulse also show a sudden change. During the test, uh, the child here was caused to have quite a significant movement also in line with a deep breath, which may well be significant to what was going on downstairs. Finally, Damien is startled by a balloon being burst. And the polygraph records changes in Twin Richard's vital signs. Over all three experiments, there's some kind of reaction that the child has, has experienced up here on each of the three tests. It could be construed that those reactions are as a result of some kind of activity downstairs. Damien's reactions appear to provoke a subconscious reaction in Richard. But can any conclusions about telepathy be drawn from the test? Probably not. For one thing, some question using a polygraph machine to test for telepathy. The polygraph charts body functions, but these may not explain what's really going on in the brain. And then there's the question of just how physically separate from each other the twins truly were. They were apart, but perhaps not perfectly isolated from each other. The demonstration took place in an old house. Richard was in an upstairs attic room behind two closed doors, two flights of stairs away from his brother. But could he have heard something or felt vibrations from downstairs? Clearly, these aren't laboratory conditions. And what about the interpretation? In an unscientific demonstration like this, an experimenter can look for favorable results and overlook things that don't fit. It's easy to criticize a demonstration like this. So could it be more fruitful with a man who tried telepathy to spy on America's enemies abroad. Such a man can be found in San Francisco and claims to have telepathic powers over great distances and with people he's never even met. In fact, he was once hired to use that skill for army intelligence. Joe McMonagall says he can receive information from another mind and all he needs is the person's photograph. According to McMonagall, he first recognized what he says is his unusual gift whilst serving with the army in Vietnam. And later, after reporting a near-death experience, was recruited into a unique intelligence program. 
The military, hoping to find ways to use telepathy for spying, employed McMonagall as one of what they called their remote viewers. He was eager to take this next challenge. Program researcher Rachel Curran has been asked to select a number of locations around San Francisco. She's never visited the Bay Area before, so her choices are random. McMonagall has not met Curran. Several miles away, he'll work in a closed room, trying to visualize a place she selects. Curran chooses six locations and photographs them. There's a yacht marina, a rock quarry, Dumbarton Bridge, Palo Alto Municipal Airport, Stanford University's football stadium, and a giant redwood tree. The photos of each location are put into six separate envelopes. Then they're given to a lawyer for safekeeping until McMonagall gets to work the next day. I'm unlocking the locked drawer here, and I'm taking out these envelopes, which have been uh, in the drawer here uh, overnight, uh, and no one else has had any access to this office during the time. The lawyer picks one set of photos with the throw of a die. This random selection process ensures that neither Curran nor McMonagall can influence the choice. So we're going to see what envelope to pick. Well, this is the one we chose. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Until she opens the envelope, Curran has no idea which location has been chosen. This ensures the researcher can't accidentally give away any secrets. Curran drives to the location in the photo. McMonagall will now try to describe what Rachel is seeing. McMonagall works from the Palo Alto offices of Ed May, a former colleague and one-time director of the McMonagall Psychic Spy Program. Neither man has any idea of who Curran is or where in San Francisco she's going. By 10.30 this morning, our, our target person named Rachel uh, is at the site. And my question is, do you know her or have you ever met her in the past? No, I haven't. McMonagall will try to connect telepathically with Curran. She will try to act as a beacon and he will try to see what Rachel sees using remote viewing. She is somewhere in the Bay Area of California. And what I'd like you to do now is just describe the surroundings in which she finds herself now. Okay. Kind of a... half arch. There's something dark about it. Like there's uh, something kind of darkness. McMonagall sets himself a 30-minute deadline to describe current surroundings. We'll return to see how accurate his remote viewing proves to be. Meanwhile, this inquiry sets off to visit a laboratory that's trying to put a scientific stamp on its psychic research. A woman tries to open her mind to receive video images from a colleague in a sealed room many yards away. Could this experiment offer any evidence to show whether telepathy exists? Claims that certain identical twins appear to react telepathically to each other have been tested, but they didn't provide any solid answers. In the meantime, an experiment is underway where a man, who once worked for the US government, claims unique telepathic powers. That claim must still be proven. So what experiments are being carried out under laboratory conditions? A visit to the University of Edinburgh can uncover more. Here, scientists are working on a version of an experiment known as the Gansfeld test. It requires a volunteer to be deeply relaxed and almost asleep. Conducting this experiment is Dr. Paul Stevens. Stevens has worked at the university's parapsychology unit for almost a decade, studying ESP and psychokinesis. While many doubt parapsychology can deliver reliable results, Stevens is trying to prove otherwise, and his work may provide just the right kind of insight. It's like a very mild sensory deprivation. 
you have a low level red light, you're in a comfy chair, you listen to the hissing white noise sound. White noise is a uniform blend of all the different frequencies. When you listen to it, it sounds mostly like sort of radio static or maybe a distant waterfall is a more, more poetic uh, image. The idea is to get you to a state just as you're about to fall asleep. Your brain's very good at looking for patterns, so if you give it something that has no patterns in it, eventually it'll tune it out. What we're doing here is more like daydreaming rather than sleep dreaming. Some 25 yards away, another volunteer, the sender, enters a sealed room and gets ready to try to transmit mental messages. A computer randomly selects a short clip of video and plays it over and over again. The sender's job is to transmit those images to the receiver. At first, the receiver's answers stray far from the mark. No telepathy here. Running water into a pond. A lake thing. The sounds make me think of the TV when it's not working. And my flat in my living room, lying on the sofa with a blanket over me. It could be just chance, but gradually the receiver appears to focus in on the video's street images. On a street with lots of cars, and rain on an umbrella. I'm walking along a street, past a pub, with cars going by. I see a red car now. Feet are going heavy, really heavy. Vague feeling of cars and a tank. Arms are clenched clenched fists, getting a blue car now, and the horns are beeping, getting a black impression with red houses in the background. The receiver's descriptions are intriguing, but there's more going on. Throughout the experiment, the sender has been hearing the receiver's voice, describing what she's visualizing. I think I'm seeing yellow lights. Getting a blue car now, and the horns are beeping. Getting a black... When the description appears to match the video scene, the sender tries to transmit a telepathic burst of positive, reinforcing thoughts to her partner. Each time she does this, she pushes an electronic key. This key records the exact moment those positive thoughts go out. The receiver, meanwhile, has electrodes attached to her fingers. These detect any changes in the electrical conductivity of her skin. Sometimes, just when the sender hits the button, the receiver does seem to show a psychological reaction. Is it in fact a reaction to the sender's reinforcing thoughts? The results are far from 100%, but Stevens thinks there might be something there. The responses may seem significant, but are they? It's a very small effect, but when you add it up all over all the people, over all the series, it does seem to be significant, and we can't find any other reason for it to be there other than there is some kind of signalling going on. But can Stevens convince his sceptics? In experiments like these, believers in telepathy find positive results, but others performing the same experiments see nothing out of the ordinary. Nevertheless, during 56 telepathy experiments, Stevens saw indications that receivers sometimes respond to positive reinforcement. When the results are published, Stevens thinks he'll prove his point. He knows he's fighting an uphill battle against a scientific community that remains extremely skeptical. Back in Northern California, McMonigal also knows that feeling but his attempt to demonstrate his telepathic abilities marches on. 20 minutes in, he says he's making progress in detailing the secret location he's been asked to describe. You get a feeling like she had to park somewhere and go through a tunnel or something or under an overpass, yeah. up a walkway of some kind under an overpass.
And then there's an up, coming abutment, just like a high overhang. This is way up over her head. From time to time, McMonagall's former colleague, Ed May, keeps him focused on Curran by showing him her picture. She's trying to act as a beacon, transmitting to McMonagall the receiver. We have a garden. It's a formal garden. Formal gardens got paths. An open area in the center. The trees. And there's some kind of a artwork of some kind in the center. But this artwork is very bizarre. It's set in gravel, stone. McMonagall lists features he believes will be found at Curran's secret location. He concentrates hard for nearly half an hour. Finally, he says he's received some images. But how accurate will they prove to be? A private telephone call to the film crew establishes Curran's location. They don't tell McMonagall, but instead take him with them to meet her. In an attempt to double check the accuracy of McMonagall's description, May carries out a parallel test. While McMonagall goes to meet Curran, May tries to identify the location by matching McMonagall's notes with one of Curran's photographs. My job is to examine each one of these sites and try to find the site that best matches what Joe McMonagall drew and what the Dunbar Bridge looks like. Gravel and stone. Redwoods is that tower. All right, now I go to work. At the end of his remote viewing session, McMonagall wrote a series of pointers which he thought best described Curran's location. Massive, heavy, high overhang. There's something large that, he had, that Rachel, the outbound person, had to actually look up to see. So he gave some assessment of how big this thing is. Smooth, rough metal stone, this overhead, heavy. There's this kind of arch going up. Well, 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 well. Let me eliminate one almost immediately. Building. Very likely. Finally, May lays out the pictures in the order he thinks most likely. This is the Dumbarton Bridge. This is a rock quarry. And this is Palo Alto Airport. Maybe the Redwood City Marina. San University Football Stadium. And Methuselah State Park. I think I'll go with this as a first place match. Uh, number one, Dumbarton Bridge. So using only McMonagall's notes and a second set of Curran's photographs, May chooses the bridge location. And that's just where McMonagall is heading. Now I understand what I was doing. <laughs> the approach to the location runs through a tunnel underpass. That's exactly what I was saying right there. That's exactly what I was getting. Although his earlier description didn't match exactly, McMonagall believes he's in the right place. Curran is standing in a viewing area for Dumbarton Bridge. McMonagall believes that his work is accurate. For him, that's no surprise. After all, it's not the first time he's done this sort of work. And in the past, the US government believed in him too. His job was to spy on the nation's enemies and to provide intelligence on vital military targets. McMonagall was part of the once top secret project Stargate. McMonagall says he and his colleagues pinpointed hidden military bases. Bases that were on the other side of the world. The examples seen so far of what might be regarded as telepathy have been somewhat dubious. Half -arch. So the focus stays with our ex-US intelligence operator, who says he can describe a hidden location miles away. 
Joe McMonagall says he discovered his skills about 25 years ago. At the time, the intelligence community was seeking ways to harness telepathy to win the Cold War. Fourth of November, 1979, the hostage crisis in Iran. The start of a 444-day nightmare. The administration tries anything. Conventional intelligence techniques and an unusual asset, agents claiming telepathic powers. Continents away from Iran, this inconspicuous hut at Fort Meade, Maryland, housed the top secret US government telepathy project known as Project Stargate. It employed people who believed they could sense events thousands of miles away. The CIA termed their ability remote viewing. McMonagall says he worked for a year as a remote viewer on the hostage crisis. They called us in and presented us with literally hundreds of photographs and asked us to try to identify who the actual hostages were. Next, McMonagall says the remote viewers tried to gather more information on the hostages and their situation. Doing everything from um, targeting the condition of the hostages to trying to discover which rooms hostages were being held in, their medical condition who the hostage takers were, how they were armed, what kind of weaponry was being used. McMonagall claims that his team's descriptions were corroborated. The remote viewing team lasted for more than two decades after its inception when the CIA heard of early telepathic experiments conducted by quantum physicist Hal Putoff. Suddenly, these people from the CIA came by and they said, well, have we been looking for you? And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, we've been investigating the rumors and the data that the Soviet Union has been involved in serious psychic research for well over a decade spending lots of money, we have no way to evaluate this data. So we've been looking for an investigator that might look into this for us. I'm a physicist, a quantum physicist, and so the idea that there may be some aspect of scientific theory involving consciousness that had not yet made it into our physics lexicon, that was a challenge to me and an interest to me as a physicist. Putoff assembled a team to begin telepathy and remote viewing experiments for the CIA at Stanford Research Institute. And our particular activity took place in a secure building located here, the Radio Physics Laboratory, and that's where most of our research took place. Former remote viewers report that they tried to concentrate on another human mind, known by them as the beacon at the target location. It's like you've got a door between you and the scene. And it's like you poke a small hole through the door, and you get a little glimpse, and you poke another hole through the door, and you get a little glimpse. Each hole is like a subliminal uh, perception experiment. You do something quickly. You just keep poking, and eventually the door finally has enough holes in it that it kind of crumbles, and you get a pretty good view of the scene. Uh, we don't know actually what's involved in the transmittal of the information in the beacon targets. Uh, there could be telepathy involved where there's mind-to-mind -mind communication between the person who's acting as the beacon and the remote viewer. Obviously, this would require someone at the target site to act as a telepathic beacon. But using agents was difficult inside the Soviet Union. So the remote viewers came up with an unlikely solution. They dispensed with the use of the beacon mind and replaced them with nothing. They simply concentrated on the location's map coordinates. It was a major shift from attempting telepathy to something perhaps better described as clairvoyance. But the remote viewers still believed they were getting results. Making the jump from 
beacon to geographical coordinates is, you might say at the psychological level, an impossible jump. But it, uh, our program was completely empirically driven. So if we saw a result, it didn't matter. We couldn't explain it. We had no idea how it worked. If we saw a result, we followed the data wherever it took us. Viewers were asked to target a Soviet facility at Semipalatinsk in Kazakhstan. Putov claims the results were remarkable. We carried out a remote viewing experiment over an hour or so, describing the layout of a facility, and finally ending up saying that the most striking feature of this site was a very large crane that rolled over a top of a building. In fact, the crane was so large that a man would only be half a wheel height. This is what, in fact, the site looks like. He was correct. There was a very large crane. It did roll over the top of the building. Since the semi-Palatinsk viewing was first made public, however, the accuracy of remote viewing of the surrounding site has been criticized. But for McMonagall, telepathy is a reality. So much so Something that he's turned it into a business, hiring out his remote viewing services to commercial companies. Picture the following image. It's sort of like someone blindfolding you so that you're in a totally inky black place where you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's so black, and at some point, a flash bulb goes off, and it's absolutely brilliant. And you see an entire room filled with stuff. And you're in that inky black space again. And somebody's, somebody's asking you, quick, tell me where you are. Can you explain it scientifically? No, I don't think we're there yet. McMonagall claims he was then given a real target. The National Security Council wanted to know more about what was happening inside a huge new building in the north of the Soviet Union, at Severodvinsk, a port on the White Sea. I was asked to describe what was going on under the roof of this building. <clears throat> and the image I had was of two very large cylinders being welded together. I saw canted missile tubes. I saw a unique drive system. And all of this was taking place next to a standard-sized submarine, which I found to be dwarfed next to the size of this one that was under construction. It was absolutely huge. The size, I guess, is being almost twice the size of a standard submarine. He says he's the one who worked out that the building was in fact a submarine factory, even if it was half a mile from the sea with no waterway. According to McMonagall, the proof came a few months later. About 100 days later, big bulldozers showed up and started cutting a canal to the sea and they launched the largest submarine in the world, which was the Typhoon-class submarine. They call it the beaver tail because it's so huge and wide in the rear. I actually was awarded a Legion of Merit, one of the highest peacetime awards that can be given in the military. And I received the Legion of Merit predominantly for my remote viewing, and this is what the Legion of Merit looks like. Despite McMonagall's claims, many remain skeptical of remote viewing. In 1995, the CIA commissioned a report on the program. One of its authors criticized parts of the unit's experimental methodology. He concluded that there was no proof that effects that had been observed were the result of remote viewing. The report found no evidence that remote viewing was operationally useful. In fact, they found no proof that it gathered military intelligence effectively. After running for over 20 years, the remote viewing program was officially closed down. Since Project Stargate was terminated, scientists have continued to research the possible existence of telepathy. 
Some now believe they have found evidence indicating which part of the brain might be stimulated in an experiment testing for telepathy. There's one more place to delve, deep into the nerve centers of the human brain. The average human brain has 100 billion neurons. It is capable of storing memories of places, people, sensations and thoughts for a lifetime. But can it transmit those thoughts by telepathy? If telepathy does exist, what can the brain reveal about it? The Bastyr University near Seattle, Washington is dedicated to the study of natural medicine and alternative health. Researchers here are attempting to measure what is going on in the brains of people trying to communicate by telepathy. In this case, their mother and daughter. The experiment starts by placing each in a separate and secure room. Each is fitted to an EEG machine that measures electromagnetic brain waves. It's essentially a cap with electrodes that picks up waves from various parts of the skull. Jorge, the sender, is going to attempt to relay telepathic signals to her daughter, Ingrid, the receiver, in the next room. Conducting gel is squirted onto the scalp to help the electrodes pick up signals from the brain. Before the experiment starts, both Yorga and Ingrid are told to relax by meditating. The Bastia researchers believe that this gets the brain into the so-called alpha state, the brain's relaxed, reflective state. Then the mother, the sender in the next room, receives a simple visual stimulus to her brain, a checkered pattern that suddenly changes. The tiny blip on the lower lines of the EEG trace represents the time when the checker pattern changes. Later, the daughter's brain in the room next door appears to show activity. Could it be her response to the checkerboard movement next door? Has the visual stimulation of the mother's brain really provoked a reaction in her daughter's brain waves? Are these two events random coincidence? or could they be related? Statistical analysis of scores of tests indicate that for a few people, the effect may be more than random chance. Scientists here now accept the possibility that some receivers' brains inexplicably react to another unconnected mind 30 feet away. Research associate professor Clark Johnson was initially skeptical of the results. I've been one of our major skeptics here in this group. I, we'll get results and I just say, you know, that just can't be right. Let's keep looking here. And I've run out of ways of convincing myself that we've made any mistakes. I can't find any right now. The experiment is repeated, this time with a receiver inside an MRI scanner. Will she react once again milliseconds after the checkerboard pattern changes? The MRI images suggests that this area at the back of some receiver's brains, the part that registers visual input, is being stimulated. It could be no more than coincidence, but if this really is an indication of telepathy, could this part of the brain be reacting to telepathic signals? Back in San Francisco, the beacon and the receiver finally meet. How successful has McGonagall been in describing her location? At 10.30 a.m., uh, I started off with a half arch. I said it was a passage that went into an area that was curved on one side. I had a tunneling effect, very dark on the right-hand side. This is a way into wherever you were going. Yes. I had big, heavy material with a high overhang. I said it was like a bridge overhang or an abutment of some kind. Getting the overhang and the abutment. Very heavy abutment, yeah. 
and that was I kept that kept throwing me off because the passage was everything about it. I took a break here. And they had some kind of a ground pattern, and it was a clearing, an open area, very smooth, set in gravel or stone. Uh, my sense was that it was nothing, which basically we're standing in nothing. And, and what happens then, in a lot of cases, you have a tendency to start inventing things. McMonagall genuinely believes he has got many elements of the location correct, but have his statements been retrofitted after the fact? It may be that McMonagall described the scene so generally that it could fit many different locations. At 10.30 a.m. Let's rewind for a moment. First, Joe drives into the underpass. That's exactly what I was seeing right there. That's exactly what I was getting. Now I understand what I was getting. <laughs> McMonagall believes he's successfully described Curran's final journey to the target and the immediate surroundings where she's standing. Yet he has failed to mention or identify the actual target itself, Dumbarton Bridge. This is a classic remote viewing because some of it's very on and some of it's not so sure, on. Yeah. And what of the secondary experiment with May? Let's rewind on that one too. A second set of pictures were used without any clues being given to May about which envelope to choose. But without the controls of a full scientific experiment, there's no certainty. And of course, it can't be ruled out that his choice was no more than pure coincidence. The bizarre artwork McMonagall described must also be taken into account. It was a work of art here, but I couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> and I think maybe those pictures. It could be those pictures. That kept getting me, though. It's defining the work of art. I know. The question is, can any evidence from McMonagall's efforts to find Curran be accepted? Sadly not. This experiment doesn't meet the key criteria to make it scientifically solid. It's not controlled, measurable, or repeatable. See what envelope to pick. Science aside, common sense also raises some concerns too. Curran and her selection of sites are probably not truly random. Perhaps another person would pick sites not unique to the area, like a parking lot or a church. And perhaps McMonagall just got lucky by painting a general picture that could refer to a number of very different structures. Whether McMonagall's experiment offers any proof that telepathy exists remains unconvincing. And what about the other demonstrations? Unusual phenomena that seem to bend the rules of scientific reason. Twin boys who could be responding to each other, fascinating but inconclusive. Young women studied under laboratory conditions. On a street with lots of cars. Scientists disagree on whether the reactions measured under these conditions are significant or coincidental. Former intelligence agents challenged to remotely sense a secret location, a success or not. Mother and daughter their brains appearing to respond within milliseconds. Telepathy or wishful thinking? And while some evidence may appear to be significant, it's most likely to be nothing more than coincidence. Even if it was accepted, no one can explain how it works or why. Until there is incontrovertible data, telepathy must remain on the fringes. Though fascinating, it remains to be a real science. Fascinating, yes, but a real science, no.